This week, I will remember the anniversary of a tragic event that happened September 15, 1963. Four little girls were killed and 14 injured in a bomb blast at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I got a chance to talk to my friend Argo J, one of the leaders in the gun movement, who's producing a new documentary. He calls it Black Ops, and we're going to have an extensive conversation about all that he's doing. Michael J. Woodland talks about long-range shooting. All this and more, coming up next. Hi, my name is Reverend Ken Blanchard, the guy known as the black man with a gun. And this is the podcast of the African-American gun community, amplifying our voices with American history, sharing training, news, and positive information for all America. Welcome to the show. This has become a really wet September already with the storms, Harvey and Irma and all the ones that are coming to, to fruition right now in the sea. My hat's out to all those who are helping our brothers and sisters wherever they are. For those who are putting boots on the ground, who are actually putting some muscle behind it. And even those who are giving of the resources to help those in need. That's what we need more of in America. That's what we need more of in our communities. To step outside of yourself. To help somebody in need. The truth of the matter is nobody's ever become poor by giving. Somebody said that the purpose of life is not to be happy. It's to be useful, it's to be honorable, it's to be compassionate, and to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. I agree with that. How you making out? You doing okay? Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man of the Gun Show. I appreciate you being here. If you like what you hear, please share it with somebody. Let's start this party off with Michael J. Woodland. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland, and today we're going to discuss getting back into the art of long-range precision. For the past couple of weeks, the thought has been dancing in my head about getting back into the realm of shooting long distance. There are many factors that overtook shooting long range, but shooting in general is the main reason. Now, I pulled out the precision rifle and blew the dust off of it. Attached the scope back on it, pulled out the Kestrel, found my sand sock, and now I'm ready to get back in business. Sometime this week, I will go out and re-zero the rifle and, of course, post video and pics. In part of all this, my sidearm, Johnny King, stated he will introduce me to hunting. So we will mix the two together and see what will happen. Also, after talking with my buddy Craig Jordan, who was an instructor at the United States Army Sniper School and owner of OSAC Apparel, the motivation came back. There is a story to how Craig and I met, but I will leave that for another time. But I will tell you, because of Craig, he was one of the contributing factors for me to win the 2014 Long Range Competition at Fort Benning. Why the love for long distance? What about all the gear? The calculations will give me a headache, but... Shooting long distance is easier than what most think. It all starts with a quality rifle, a decent scope, and the drive to push yourself. Here in the next couple weeks, I will be posting a video of shooting with the precision rifle. Hopefully, we can get footage of shooting at various locations at distance. This is where the audience comes in. Here in South Carolina, I have found a local range that has a distance of 300 yards. I would like to push it out to at least a thousand meters. There is a range in the upper state of South Carolina with the capabilities of a thousand yards. If you have a location that is more than 300 yards or you're willing to travel with me to the range in upper South Carolina, email myself or Ken and let us know. We might arrange it where it will be fun for all parties and you can even be a part of the tips and review segment on a future podcast with me as we're shooting at the range. Let me hear from you all who are into long range precision and let me know what setups you have, brand of equipment you recommend, and any pics you have of your achievements with long range shooting. For those who are looking to contact me, visit blackmanwiththegun.com and under the leaders tab, 
click on my name, Michael Woodland, and shoot me an email. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. Thanks, Brother Michael. And maybe we got to get Johnny King to talk about hunting, too. That could be a feature here on your favorite righteous podcast, The Black Man with a Gun. Get the book, Black Man with a Gun, Reloaded. The story of Reverend Ken Blanchard. A Marine Corps veteran, a former federal police officer, a firearms trainer, former CIA officer, a published author, and now podcaster. I'm the founder of the 10th Cavalry Gun Club. I've lobbied and testified before the United States Congress, Texas, South Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, Virginia, and Maryland for an individual right of self-defense. And they call me the black man with a gun. You can get the link on blackmanwithagun.com or on amazon.com. Black man with a gun. Reloaded. Get your copy today. One of the things I remember and I keep forgetting is that no matter how much you prepare, you still got to kind of call on people every once in a while and remind them that you're doing stuff for them. You can have a cookout, spend all day cutting the grass, making the lawn look nice, put the chairs out, clean the chairs out, cook on the grill. You know how we do. Make a, a spread that can feed hundreds of people. And if you don't tell people, remind them they might not show up and then you all be for nothing. It's time to press forward. It's time to do better than we did last year. And to do that, you got to know where you're coming from. You got to know that the bad times were actually behind us and the good times are ahead. You got to put it in perspective. So let's go back to 1963. At 10.22 a.m., On the morning of September 15th, 1963, some 200 church members were in a building, many attending Sunday school classes before the start of the 11 a.m. service, when a bomb detonated on the church's east side, spraying mortar and bricks from the front of the church and caving in its interior walls. Most parishioners were able to evacuate the building as it filled with smoke, but the bodies of four young girls, 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley and Carol Robinson and 11-year-old Denise McNair were found beneath the rubble in a basement restroom. 10-year-old Sarah Collins, who was also in the restroom at the time of the explosion, lost her right eye and more than 20 other people were injured in the blast. This was right after the inspiring words of Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech that rang out from the Lincoln Memorial during the historic march on Washington in August of 1963. It seemed things didn't get better right away. Americans of African descent got another taste of domestic terrorism. Terrorism. Targeting victims within a country by a perpetrator with the same citizenship as the victims. There are many definitions of terrorism and no universally accepted definition The U.S. Department of State defined terrorism in 2003 as premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets of subnational groups or clandestine agents usually intended to influence an audience. The statutory definition of domestic terrorism in the U.S. has changed many times over the years, and it can be argued that acts of domestic terrorism have been occurring since long before any legal definition was set forth. Historically, this is one of the reasons that many people of color armed themselves during my generation as a child. Terrorism itself is not new. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church on September 15th was the third bombing in 11 days after a federal court order had come down mandating the integration of Alabama's school system. In the aftermath of the bombing, Thousands of angry black protesters gathered at the scene of the bombing. When Governor Wallace sent police and state troopers to break the protest up, violence broke out across the city. A number of protesters were arrested and two young African-American men were killed, one by police, before the National Guard was called in to restore order. 
The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King later spoke before 8,000 people at the funeral for three of the girls. The family of the fourth girl held a smaller private service, fueling the public outrage now mounting across the country. If you think that protesting is new, if you think that police and civilian issues are new, you are wrong. Under current United States law set forth in the USA Patriot Act, acts of domestic terrorism are those which a involved acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state. B appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination or kidnapping and C occur primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. History tells us that though Birmingham's white supremacists and even certain individuals were immediately suspected in the bombing, repeated calls for the perpetrators to be brought to justice went unanswered for more than a decade. It was later revealed that the Federal Bureau of Investigation had information concerning the identity of the bombers by 1965 and did nothing. J. Edgar Hoover, then head of the FBI, disapproved of the civil rights movement. He died in 1972. In 1977, Alabama Attorney General Bob Baxley reopened the investigation and Klan leader Robert E. Chambliss was brought to trial for the bombings and convicted for murder. Continuing to maintain his innocence, Chambliss died in prison in 1985. The case was again reopened in 1980, 88, and 97 when two other former Klan members, Thomas Blatton and Bob Frank Cherry, were finally brought to trial. Blatton was convicted in 2001 and Cherry in 2002. A fourth suspect, Herman Frank Cash, died in 1994 before he could be brought to trial. Even though the legal system was slow to provide justice, the effect of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church was immediate and significant. Outrage over the death of the four innocent girls helped build increased support behind the continued struggle to end segregation, support that would help lead the passage of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In that important sense, the bombing's impact was exactly the opposite of what its perpetrators had intended. So let's go back and do a time. September 15th, after the four girls were killed and 14 injured in a bomb blast, riots break out and two African-American boys, Virgil Ware, 13, and Johnny Robinson, 16, are also killed. And all, at least 20 people, were injured from the initial bombing and ensuing riots. Alabama Governor George Wallace sends out 500 National Guardsmen and 300 state troopers to the city. The next day, they are joined by 500 police officers and 150 sheriff's deputies. September 16, 1963, President John F. Kennedy responds by saying, quote, If these cruel and tragic events can only awaken that city and state, if they can only awaken this entire nation to a realization of the folly of racial injustice and hatred and violence, then it's not too late for all concerned to unite in steps toward peaceful progress before more lives are lost. End quote. September 16th, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holds a press conference in Birmingham saying that the U.S. Army, quote, ought to come to Birmingham and take over the city and run it. 65. Suspects emerge, Bobby Frank Cherry, Thomas Blanton, Robert Chambliss, and Herman Frank Cash, all Ku Klux Klan members. Witnesses are reluctant to talk, and physical evidence is lacking, so charges are not filed. 76. Alabama Attorney General Bill Blackston reopens the case. September 26, 1977, Robert Chambliss, 73, a retired auto mechanic and former Ku Klux Klan member, is indicted by Jefferson County Grand Jury on four counts of first-degree murder. November 15, 1977. On the second day of the trial, Chambliss's niece, Elizabeth Cobb, testifies that before the bombing, Chambliss confided to her that he had enough stuff to put away and flatten half of Birmingham. November 18, 1977. Chambliss is convicted of first-degree murder in connection with the bombing and sentenced to life imprisonment. 1985. Chambliss dies in prison. 1994, Herman Frank Cash dies without being charged in the bombing. July 1997, the case is reopened by the FBI, citing new evidence. 
May 16, 2000, a grand jury in Alabama indicts former Klansmen Bobby Frank Cherry and Tommy Blanton with eight counts, each for first-degree murder, four counts of intentional murder, and four of murder with universal malice. May 1, 2001, Thomas Blanton is found guilty of first-degree murder and is sentenced to four life terms. May 22, 2002, Bobby Frank Cherry is found guilty and given a sentence for four life terms. November 8, 2004, Cherry dies in prison. February 20, 2006, the 16th Street Baptist Church is declared a National Historic Landmark. September 12, 2013, 15 years after the bombing, all four girls who died are awarded Congressional Gold Medals. September 14, 2013, a bronze and steel statue of the four girls is unveiled. It is located, located at Kelly Ingram Park on the corner of 16th Street North and 6th Avenue North. From the beginning of recorded history, man's existence has been marked by the presence of enemies, both real and imagined. Warriors have always been faced with several key questions when facing an enemy. Primary among them was to determine who the enemy was. In the War of Independence, the enemy was identified by their colors, red coats versus blue coats. In the Civil War, it was blue versus gray. In the Second World War, the Germans wore gray uniforms and the British brown and the Americans green. As you marinate on the history that I provide for you on this podcast, I challenge you to consider how you think of your enemy. Who truly is your enemy? I guarantee you it is not a color. It's internal. It's ideology. It's a belief system. It's the values. Don't get caught up on race. Or you yourself will become a racist. Reminds me of 1 Samuel sixteen seven, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Things to think about. Thanks. This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. I got the pleasure of having Argo J on the mic, and uh, welcome to the show, bro. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. We met a while back. How'd that story start? <laughs> well, uh, I started uh, a YouTube channel a while ago doing some YouTube videos inspired by a young brother named Coley on the Wire, and then I decided to do my own thing, and one of my videos, I called myself being original, and I entitled one of my segments BMWAG which stood for black man with a gun. Then, uh, you know, a couple days later, after the video went out through whatever back channels or back channels you had, uh, you contacted me and said, Hey, you know, that's, that, that's my moniker, you know? <laughs> and I, and I, and me being who I am, like I didn't know at the time, you know, and I was like, I was very apologetic and I said, Oh, you know, I'll, I'll get rid of it. I, you know, I, you know, no, you know, I wasn't trying to intrude on, on, on what was yours and, you know, I'll take it down, this, that, and the other, and being the true gentleman that you are, you said, no, my brother, no. I'd be honored if you kept it up, man. Keep it up. You know, just keep doing the good things and keep doing the work. And, and you know, from then on, you know, uh, I, I didn't use it anymore, but, you know, just the fact that you gave me your blessing or whatnot, instead of being harsh about it, which you could have been, you had every right to be, uh, you know, you were very welcoming and very nurturing and, and kind of helped me out in this. And, and, and I really appreciate that. So, you know, we've known each other since then. Now, many years have passed and you've been cranking out stuff. You've been writing stuff and doing reviews and mm -hmm. where folks find you where mostly. Uh, folks can still find me on uh, uh, my YouTube channel, Argo J. It's spelled with three A's, uh, A-A-A-R-G-O-J-A-Y. I'm on Instagram pretty much. I'm on Facebook. I don't do Twitter as much. Uh, you can definitely find me there. Um, I write for Skillset Magazine. I've got a nice article coming out uh, pretty soon with uh, with Mosh Teray. 
uh, interviewing Maj Ture. So that article should be coming out within the next few issues, two to three issues. Uh, I'm doing some freelance writing there, doing some blogs and a lot of podcasts and different things. But no, I'm 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 working around, definitely. All right, and Coleon inspired you to do this thing. What you do before? Uh, I'm a teacher by trade. Um, I've been a teacher for the last seven, uh, no, officially 12 years. Uh, been working with kids for about 20 years, closer to 20 years. But uh, that's what I've been doing. And then, you know, I just happened to have an unfortunate incident happen to me at my home. And I was already watching YouTube gun videos and, and whatnot. And I saw this young brother, you know, talking and speaking so eloquently and so passionate about this thing that we all love. And I said, you know what? I can do that too. And, uh, I put my first video out there with a buddy of mine. You know, we didn't have, we didn't know what we were doing <laughs> at all. Uh, and, and that's where it all started. But now come full circle, you're getting ready to launch your own process. What you got going on right now? Oh man, it's been, I've been working very hard on this man since the last, uh, NRA, uh, annual meetings. But, uh, I came up with the idea for a documentary. Uh, the documentary is called Black Ops, uh, which is an acronym. It stands for Black Opinion in Popular Society. And the purpose of the documentary is to attack the stereotypes of black men in firearms. Um, you know, the, the, we're not all thugs. We're not all drug dealers and gangbangers and, you know, uh, undesirables. We're not. You know, uh, yourself, you're a reverend, you're a businessman, an author. Uh, I'm a teacher. Noir is a, an, an attorney. Uh, you know, we've got you know young people who are young brothers who are entrepreneurs and businessmen and 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 doctors and you know we have we have we run the whole gamut of of professions and no matter what seems to be, people always think of us as as the negative. You know, and we need to break that stereotype. And I've uh, enlisted some pretty pretty heavy hitters as far as what I say. Um, and the people that I can mention as of right now are myself, uh, you, Coleon Noir, Maj Ture, uh, two young cops out of the St. Louis area or law enforcement officers out of St. Louis area. Um, I've got some officers in the Boston area out in the Northeast uh, that were on Donnie Wahlberg's uh, Boston's Finest uh, reality documentary, uh, uh, excuse me, TV series. Um, and some other people. Uh, I talked to Tyson Becker, the supermodel and actor. Uh, he's a very big 2A supporter. Um, he is interested in doing it. We just got to make sure our schedule's aligned. Um, I just got the mailman himself, Carl Malone, to agree to do it. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, there are going to be some pretty big names in there. I mean, some rappers. Uh, you know, I'm trying to stay away from a lot of the new rappers, of course, but a lot of the more conscious rappers and rappers who are out there uh, involved in activism of some sorts and, and making positive movements. Um, definitely. Um, I've reached out to, and we're looking to hear back from them. So the response has been pretty positive so far. I haven't had anybody say, no, I can't do it or won't do it. So that's good, man. So you are going against the black codes created to keep black men from owning firearms. You are just going right at it straight. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, uh, uh, why, why should we not own firearms? You know, uh, because it's funny. One of the protesters at the, the the NRA Carry Guard Expo was just here in my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, this past week or two weekends ago, not this weekend, but two weekends ago. And I went out to speak to some of the protesters who were speaking, you know, uh, against guns. And I did so very politely and respectfully and, you know, not trying to infringe on their right to protest and do what they want to do. And if that's what they believe, I support that. And I even told them that I support your right to be here. Somebody came out to stop you. I, you know, I would attack them, not physically attack, but I would attack them before you because this is your right. I will help you support your right. Uh, but it's funny because one of the ladies said, you know, the reason that she was only reason she was talking to us is because we were black. And how could we as black men support firearms because our community has been so damaged by it? And I said, yeah, but that's only one small portion of our community. OK, that's the illegal portion of the community. People who tend to do illegal acts or commit illegal acts. I don't condone illegal activity at all. Uh, I don't support it. Uh, but 
didn't know if she was aware that illegal acts happen in every community. You know what I mean? Whether you're white, whether you're black, Hispanic, or Asian, it happens in all of community and all of America's community. So to say that, you know, uh, violence is something that's just germane to black people is just, is just a ridiculous thought. And we have to break that thinking. We have to break that, that, that overall thought that being black means you have to be a victim and you can't stand up and fight for yourself, nor should you want to, you know, so we have to accept our victimhood and we have to accept our negative community and the negative things that are happening in our community and and fight them without being able to pick up a a firearm and protect ourselves and protect our families and protect the things that we've worked so hard to, to, to get, you know, and by that, I mean the peace of mind that we work so hard to achieve. So, yeah, there's only a few instances in our history. Uh, Nat Turner, the people who took over to Amistad, the uh, the folks in South Carolina who rebelled against slaveholders that changed the whole dynamic that made them say, "Well, we can't give them a firearm because they're they're more violent. They'll they'll get some payback, some retribution." And our people have latched on to this thing, say that, "Well, since it's going to get my son or my, my my husband locked up in a work camp or killed or lynched." Let me just make it so that nobody can have a gun. And that thing just kept on going. You could be anybody else except for a black man. So what you're doing, man, I, I admire and I commend you for doing it. Well, well, definitely, like I said, but, you know, like th- there, there would be no me without people like you. Uh, you were one of my first inspirations before Noir. Uh, like I said to you before we started filming or taping this episode, I saw you on Cam and Company, uh, one NRA show. And I was just blown away. I said, there's this black man who is opposite everything that even I at the time thought was a reality. And I said, this is this is phenomenal. And you were saying the same things that I felt and that I thought. But I thought that I was the only one thinking them because it is such a taboo and it is such a no, no, uh, you know, socially to have those thoughts. You know, and if we think like that as black men. You know, in the black society, we're, we're, we're coons and sellouts and this, that and the other. Uh, and outside of the black community, we're, we're still not looked upon as worthy. You know, so, it, you know, it's kind of you're always in this middle doing this dance, trying to balance both ends. But I'm, I'm, I'm done doing that. I'm done trying to balance both ends. I am who I am. My family and my kids and my son, they're going to be who they're going to be as American citizens, whether people like it or not. We're going to exercise all of our rights. Uh, including the Second Amendment, right? And and we're going to progress forward, you know, and we're not going to take this, this, you know, I say this all the time, you know, we as black people, we have to stop with this we shall overcome and kumbaya attitude waiting for people to recognize us. That's not, that's not going to happen. You know, we have to take it. We have to make ourselves known, make ourselves seen. And that's what I'm doing. And that's more American than anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. I work hard every day, just like most of America, bust my butt nine to five. And when I come home, uh, you know, my family depends on me just like anybody else. You know, just because I'm black doesn't mean that when I come home, oh, let's start smoking dope and killing people. No, that's not what happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not what happens at all. So, you know, but some people do think that and it's and it's a sad reality. And it's a reality that needs to be uh, brought to light and be addressed. We have to have those conversations and everybody's scared to have those conversations. It's, you know, it's walk, it's walking on eggshells when you start to discuss race and like, we need to have those conversations in order to get past them. There's no way we can get past them if we don't address them. That's how I got past it. I was, um, I had a roommate who probably was the scariest Marine ever. Um, he was the real deal. He was Rambo in real life. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and this dude grew up hard. So when we got together one day and, and the, 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 the curtain was down and it was just me and him. And I said, dude, every racist thing that you can think of, right, right on this piece of paper here, I want to I wanna see every name you can think of. We, we had nothing else to do. We were just, we just hanging out. That, mm-hmm. dude, that dude filled up like three pages of racist names and blew my mind. I didn't know the depth of what I had asked him. He was going for it. And I, I was sitting there with my shock. So he goes, all right, your turn. And I probably had like five or six words. That was mm-hmm. it. And um, I was like, all right. So where did you get all this from? And, and we went through this long conversation about his parents, about his, how he grew up and how, what he believes now. And after all that was over, 
that dude was my brother. I mean, it was like, all right, so I know that you got a jacked up pass. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, right. But we're going to be all right now, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And I was like, yeah, me either. So from this point on, we started from scratch. And to this day, um, I'm glad it's Facebook only for that reason, because there's some people that I don't get to see. But when when Sergeant Major Hakala is is a retired Marine is on the, on Facebook, you know, everybody is like paying attention. I know that joker from way back in the day when it was just me and him hashing out race, race stuff. I mean, it was like right. small bitty stuff, but it was huge to me because I learned so much from that dude. And from that point on, I was able to go forward. Absolutely. And you know, that's what has to happen. Uh, that's exactly what has to happen nationally. Uh, and it needs to be made public. Like we have to overcome this. I mean, Racial tension is very, very high in our country right now, uh, being made higher by ignorance and fear yeah. and and the propaganda that's being spit out there. And it's it's ridiculous. I look at I look at Houston right now, you know, and first of all, I got to say, you know, prayers are still going out to all those affected by Hurricane Harvey yeah. and and all those people who are who have lost so much, you know, in that in that the tragic hurricane. But uh, I look at how America comes together. When things happen, I watch people and, and I, I get teary sometimes. So I, some, I got to suck it up. But, uh, you know, I watch how people of all colors go down there and went down there to help. And they went down there to help people indiscriminate of what race they were, what religion they were, what what sexual orientation they had. You know what I mean? What their thoughts were. We're going to help America because America needs help. And I saw white people helping. I saw black people helping. I saw white people helping black people, black people helping whites. Come on now. Like, like at, at, if we're going to live in this country, we have to learn to live together. You know, we have to we have to put aside our differences as black, white and brown and learn to live under the red, white and blue. You know, and not saying that we need to forget where we came from and we need to forget our history. That's not what I'm saying at all. Our history is important to us. But at a certain time, at a, it, we need to be able to let go of the negative parts of our history and not let that hold us back and not let that uh, keep us from progressing, you know, never forgetting, but still being forgive, forgiving and moving forward. You know, man, you said a lot right there. See, I thought we were there already, but we went backwards all of a sudden with a new movement of people who don't know their history and they're rehashing some stuff that I thought we had got over, but obviously we haven't. So until they catch up, we're going to still be going back and forth. And for those who are not um, faithfully and spiritually minded, to me, what happened in Harvey was an act of God. I mean, absolutely. The, the, the fact that, oh, you want to fight about this guy? You want to fight about this rule? You want to fight? You want to protest about this? I'll give you something to work toward. Because see, Scripture also said that brothers are made in adversity. So one of the things that happened is just what you said. So, now we got, you got no time to fight each other. You got to fight with each other now to save somebody. So that it changed Absolutely. everything. And I, and I wish it happened again, like 9-11. I remember the weeks after 9-11, this country was rolling like, like a well or a machine. Church, oh my God. Churches was packed. People was happy. People were talking to each other. And then we slowly melted away. And unfortunately, we had to go back to tragedy before America shows its good side again. And and that's and that's sad, you know. And it, and it happened every time something tragic happens. Yeah. Uh, after after nine eleven, after Katrina. Yeah. After you know Harvey this time, but you know after the shooting in South Carolina, the church shooting in South Carolina, yeah. you know, uh, you know, we we come together in our in our most and most sincere times of need, but it doesn't last. Yeah. You know, which is which is disheartening and which is sad in and of itself, but. I agree with you. You know, I think God was very, very upset with us and and his tears flooded Houston, yeah. one of the largest cities in our country yeah, uh, and and forced us to say, hey, put down your arms and join arms. Yeah. You know what I mean? If yeah. you know what I'm saying, yeah, I do. you know, and I, I, I literally watch guys who look like big burly rednecks carrying out small black babies. And 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 helping people, you know, with their own. First of all, they're not getting paid for it. They're not seeking reimbursement. They're doing this because as children of God this is what we're supposed to do. 
you know, and and regardless of color, regardless of race or whatnot, America is a strong country. And sometimes we need those reminders because we forget we buy into the hype and the propaganda and the lies and the hate. You know, we do. And I think with this uh, with our current president, I think a lot of people have used our current president as a gateway to be open with their hate. And I don't think that our president uh, uh, agrees with that, with that thought and with that sentiment or those negative, hateful sentiments. Um, but whether you like him or not, or, you know, he's our president. And, you know, I can't think of too many presidents that I agreed wholeheartedly with or I liked. And I definitely, you know, disagree politically with a lot of things that most presidents do. But at the end of the day, I always support them because they're the president of these nice United States. Thing. Yeah, man. There you go. It's, it's, you called, know, it's called respect. It is. It is. And I will never disrespect that office or that title. You will never hear me disrespect. I, I wasn't a big Obama supporter. And people, you know, a lot of black people say, oh, my God, you're a coon. You're, you know, you're an Uncle Tom, this, that, and the other. Well, first of all, if you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, then calling me an Uncle Tom isn't really, really what you're trying to say, first of all. But that's having you know, that's to have knowledge that you don't have that's being ignorant but uh you know that's political i respect him as a black man for what he accomplished and the feats that he has overcome to to get to that that office you better believe it and yes i i i recognize and i see his swagger and his dapper and his dabonair and i like it and i love it but politically i could not agree with him on a lot of things you know and i don't think that I, and I and I just don't I just don't think that he did everything that he could do, you know, and, and I'm just not going to take it at face value because he's a black man and say, oh, I'm giving you 100 percent of my support just because we're the same color. Can't do it. That's racist. Yeah, absolutely. I say that all the time. <laughs> I say that all the time. And people, like, uh, you know, I get called a coon so much. It's ridiculous. I might as well just draw black circles on, on my eyes and, and become a raccoon because people call me a coon so much. It's ridiculous. But. You know, to 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 have the idea that we live in this country and we should be isolated from everybody and it should be black, this, black, that, black, this, that is a racist idea. You know, we have to learn to work together. Don't get me wrong. I support black businesses when I can. I support, you know, uh, 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 a lot of the things that we as a people are starting to come into. But I also support everybody else. You know, and and I will continue to do that because that is that that's just how we will function as a country. We can't function as a country with these divisive measures in place and keep, you know, and keep aligning ourselves with those divisive measures. You know, we just can't. So. Amen, man. Amen. I'm let that one just I'm gonna just go. That's like that's it. Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it is, it's sad, man. It's a sad situation, man. You know what I mean? It is like, uh, I mean, you see it, you've been in the battle, especially the second amendment community, but the second amendment fight, you've been in this for, for, for decades, you know, and you know how hard it is to make yourself credible, you know, just because of the color of our skin, you know, or when I walk into the range and people look at me like, "Uh oh, here comes this undesirable, this unsavory character. But by the time I leave the range, everybody's corralled around my booth because they want to see what I'm shooting. Or how do you learn to shoot so well? Were you in the military or where'd you learn to build that? Like, where does anybody learn to build guns or where does anybody learn to shoot? I, I took classes. I learned. I, I sought uh, I sought out instruction and I learned, you know, just like anybody can or should. So, you know, I, it's just a sad state of affairs. But that's what Black Ops is for. We're trying to bring light to the dark. You know, and no pun intended, you know, but we're definitely trying to bring some light onto a very dark segment of America because there's a whole segment of America that still feels that black people should not own firearms. And I see it every day. I see it on the Internet every day. You know, there's there's a lot of safety in the in the. Uh, in being able to hide behind your keyboard. Yeah. The, the anonymity of 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 the Internet. You know what I mean? And uh, but it also allows people to be very honest, you know, and their honest opinions are out there. And you'll see it in the blogs and then the posts on Instagram. You'll see it all day long. You know, you'll see it. The monkeys, the niggers, the this, the that, the other. 
Uh, that's why you shouldn't own guns, this, that, and the other. And it's real. Yeah. So I'm out here trying to fight that fight for the rest of us and for the rest of those that don't look like us, because if we suffer, we all suffer. There you go. As Americans. So how soon, how soon before this project gets out, do you think? Oh, my brother, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a hard work, man. Uh, you know, I, I wish I'd have just gone the route of just filming it myself and putting it out myself instead of actually trying to make a legitimate movie out of it. Um, there's so much work that goes into it. I do not have a time frame yet. I, however, I am meeting with uh, another production company, uh, a, a production company rather, who's, who showed interest in it uh, here in Milwaukee locally. I was referred to them by um, the young brother who wrote uh, Red Tails, mm-hmm. movie Red Tails. Uh, I reached out to him because he's from Milwaukee, and uh, he uh, referred me to some people, and we're working, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're getting it worked out. So as soon as I talk to them, I'll have a more concrete deadline. Um, but I, the budget is minimal, uh, and I feel like our timeline isn't that massive uh, that would be required to get this done. So, you know, tentatively, I'm saying a year. Okay. About a year, hopefully before, if you know, if everything works out. But uh, uh, I, I definitely would like to get it out before the next uh, NRA show or by the next NRA uh, annual meetings. And if not, then at least have it uh, have enough done where I can start premiering the previews and stuff like that. So cool, cool. How can <laughs> folks help you financially get this thing moving? Oh, my brother, uh, if you want to help me financially, which we definitely need. Uh, I'm reaching out for sponsorships as well. I have sponsorship packages put together and all that. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I forget, I have so much going on that I forget all the actual, um, websites and names and all that. But you can send but, it to me later and I can post it for you. Oh yeah. And it's definitely on my Instagram. Uh, if you go to my Instagram, um, uh, it's the, uh, it's the link that's attached to my profile, but it's a GoFundMe page. It's www.gofundme.com slash black ops doc okay so slash black ops doc b-l-a-c-k-o-p-s doc d-o-c short for documentary um and definitely uh you know please go hit the gofundme because i i would love to fund this myself and be able to do this without a production company's help because i want to make sure the reason i want to be involved and want to be kept in in the the building process of this is because i want the most accurate representation being a part of this community i can give that accurate representation if i if i outsource it then i lose some of that and i want to make sure that as much of it that come as much as i can that i'm the one who's doing most of the work for this because i want an honest opinion i want an honest representation i want an honest representation of the negative side of things of the people who think we shouldn't have guns and why and the racial comments and remarks. I, I, I don't want to misrepresent them either because I think you have to cover all sides in order to get to your end result. So, you know, I just can't, I can't have half the equation and then expect to get an answer. It's just not going to happen. Spoken like a true educator. <laughs> Argo yeah. J, thank you, man, for being on the show. And um, I will put all the links to this brother on this next episode. So check it out and check out Argo J and his progress. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it much. All right, buddy. All right. This show has been sponsored by the United States Concealed Carry Association. If you want to show some love, check out the link at blackmailthegun.com for USCCA. They got some programs. They got some benefits. They have insurance that can do you well. Also supported by members like you at patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. All 26 of you have been supporting this podcast with much love. Thanks for keeping me around. Thanks for motivating me. You too can become an awesome supporter at patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. Well, all right, that's it for this week. I want to thank our regulars and our guests. I want to thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting this show. Big shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thank you for making this show possible. For more information about anybody that has been on the show today, you can find their links and information at blackmanwithagun.com. 
just in case nobody has told you this today. I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next week. Shalom, baby. This show is part of the Gun Podcast Network, an exclusive group showcasing professional pro-gun podcasts and broadcasters. Hitting our targets.